it's a big honor, as many of us feel, all of us here, to be here and uh, honoring uh, the memory of Boris, this uh, great and wonderful man. Um, I'm, uh, I decided to run the risk of uh, just honoring him to have not seen his life. So if I fail, you will miss him. If I more or less succeed, you you'll, uh, you'll see if I have learned a little bit about those uh, wonderful abilities. Um, first time I met Boris, I was uh, as an undergraduate student in Mexico. Um, there was a meeting of people working on nitrogen fixation and nitrogen assimilation. So uh, I just, uh, you know, you Sir Hans Krebs that came to Mexico and Boris and other great uh, uh, scientists. Uh, it was little interaction then to meet with him. And then um, uh, years later in 89, when I was finishing my PhD, I, uh, I had undertaken my, you know, undergrad, under, uh, sorry, my PhD project as doing a, a grammatical model of gene regulation. And I was with Alejandra Covarrubias, uh, who some of you know. Uh, she was uh, one of the supervisors of my thesis. She, we had finished, and she made all, all sort of observations. And I uh, was leaving her room, and just uh, something happened that I stood, turned around, and said, Alejandra, if uh, you were in my place, where would you be going to? And she said, uh, with Boris. Uh, so she uh, uh, called her, called him, and uh, arranged. And I had already my Mexican fellowship to go to Seattle and managed to change it to come to uh, MIT. That was uh, uh, September, August of uh, 1989 with my two-year-old son, who later, when he was around seven, in a wonderful conference that uh, uh, I was just remembering with Fred that I organized in Mexico integrative approaches to molecular biology. At the end of the conference that was co-organized with uh, Boris, uh, my son gave him a little, uh, you know, uh, gift of, uh, 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 of the uh, archaeology of Mexico, something that uh, uh, was very simple compared to the uh, deep knowledge and expertise he had on that uh, theme of collection of art. Um, so Boris was kind enough to accept me to come with this, uh, uh, you know, sort of uh, mysterious and project on, on doing a grammatical model of gene regulation. And then uh, uh, by October, I had a meeting, an appointment with uh, Noam uh, Chomsky, who had I had already published a paper on using transformation <laughs> grammars to describe uh, the structure of the lack operon in terms of rules of uh, like a grammar of promoter, operator, uh, and so on, and with movements of roots that would display, displace equivalently to the way you, you move words when you make a, when you transform an affirmative sentence into an interrogative sentence, right? You move the verb to the front. Uh, so that was the type of idea, of so moving elements that would uh, describe a, a, prom uh, an op a promoter being activated or repressed. Anyway, at that meeting, uh, I had almost no chance to talk with Noam. He was pushing me and asking me and saying, if you don't make the mathematical proof that simple grammars don't work, uh, I mean, this is not uh, well-founded, right? Um, and I remember leaving Building 22 on the ground. I didn't want to see bodies because I had just arrived and, he, and I was being challenged to say, what is it that you are doing? I went to the library that afternoon. And after having spent, in fact, in Mexico already, thoughts on that, on that uh, proof that I didn't find a way. Um, under that U stress, right, EU stress, which is the good stress, <laughs> right, that we mix with. I mean, stress is de-stress versus U stress. Uh, my brain made the click that I needed to later, a couple of three months later, keep working and I'm doing uh, that proof, which is based on what is called the uh, IJ dependency relationships, which is something, something like if you have a, a subject in singular, the verb has to be in singular, right? Uh, if you modify the verb to, uh, to the noun to, uh, to the plural, you have to make a change in the, right, uh, in the verb, no matter how far they are. 
So those are IJ dependency relationships that uh, uh, what I found the, uh, was, in fact, those relationships was like uh, the encoded in the genome helix turn helix motif of the transcription factor that goes and binds to the operator site. You modify, of course, the, right, the, the, uh, the gene that codes for that factor. You need to modify the operator for the recognition to remain. And um, um, so I spent three years in Boris lab. Uh, I had a wonderful, exciting time. And, uh, <clears throat> and uh, um, I, uh, I uh, was also you know, lucky to have uh, Jay Gralla coming for a sabbatical. So I devoted, uh, you know, there was no, I had much of the time going to the library, photocopying papers and learning and studying about gene regulation. So we managed to do the, um, the first sort of collection of, uh, of non-regulated promoters in E. coli and Klebsiella, Sigma 70, Sigma 54, and found uh, eventually somehow to make it, all of this to make sense the way, uh, you know, if you remember the way body described the interaction of, uh, of proteins with uh, DNA explaining uh, why sigma-54 can be activated at the distance, because very much you have a closed complex that, uh, that is sort of ready for whenever the, bind, the DNA binds and, and uh, brings the activator close by, as opposed to sigma-70, where there is no closed complex, so, so you would need to have two unlikely events to happen at the same time. Uh, so all of these may rational sense, um, having made the proof, having, having the collection, I then uh, made, built up this grammatical model that uh, published communicated to PNAS when I finished my, my PhD. And, uh, and I remember sitting in his office um, talking, I don't remember the details of what we were talking about, but maybe you have also had this experience of uh, having still quiet uh, hearing to what you are saying and uh, with such a, I mean, my English is not <coughs> able to, to say, but with such a presence and, uh, and absolute capability of being there for you that, at, I mean, at some point you feel like even awkward of uh, being so much fully observed in a second. I think that's a, a wonderful uh, quality that Boris had of uh, expressing love and attention to someone, right? Uh, so um, uh, I always enjoyed the jokes that Boris had on the lab and then um, people coming out of the lab and saying uh, that they didn't really enjoy very much and, you know, he was more of a European person and, um, <laughs> and uh, uh, so uh, when I finished my postdoc, body said, okay, so I'm going back, you're going back to Mexico. So you now you can invite me to visit Mexico. <laughs> <laughs> so that was August 92. By January 93, Boris was down to Mexico, <laughs> uh, being invited. And, uh, and, uh, and he explained to me the cathedral in Cuernavaca, all the art and, all the, and the history. Uh, you know, I remember once that he was unlucky to be, he had invited, and he told me, a former student when I was here, uh, to go to, to a, a music concert by Sostakovich on the 50th anniversary of the second, end of the Second World War. So she said no. So, so he said, so I invite you. So I said, yes, let's go. And we went. And on our way after the uh, concert to my home, I had read a New York Times uh, journal about the uh, first uh, uh, crusade. And Boris went to go from the first to the second to the third to the fourth thing to say. Uh, uh, it was really uh, 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 wonderful. As you know, in Mexico, giving his talks, I'm frequently talking about uh, uh, Goethe and Faust and explaining and making connections. So all, all I can say is, and I think I was trying, I was remembering, um, sorry. As a way to, sort of introduced my, my enthusiasm for gathering and collecting right, all this uh, beautiful knowledge that people like you go on in the lab after years of effort getting to understanding mechanisms. Uh, he, he explained to me how Antonio de Mendoza was the first vice, vice, vice king in Mexico, 
Hernán Cortés, Hernán Cortés was too much of a brave man, so the king didn't want him and took him away. And Antonio de Mendoza was the first uh, that uh, you know ruled Mexico. And then the uh, Spanish people asked and went into a full uh, request and sort of a census. Is that the word for gathering information of people and numbers and all of that? And what he said, and all of this was shipped to to Spain uh, and uh, Toledo, or what is it? The, remember very well the river, the, the ports in Spain, and all that stuff remained there because there was no statistics, there, was no, there were no tools for <coughs> analyzing or integrating. And uh, <coughs> so that uh, paper that we did with Boris, who wasn't very happy, he told me, because he was not the first and not the last author. <laughs> <laughs> I was the first that Jay and Reed said, okay, Julio has done enough, I don't to enough about uh, gene uh, transcriptional regulation. Uh, and Jay was the last, so Boris said, you know, it's like being nowhere. Uh, anyway, that, uh, that little microbiological review paper, uh, uh, in, uh, years later, in 2000, something like three years ago, on a meeting on Nikolai International Alliance and blah, blah, uh, Steve Bosby was the one that was introducing the, the, the conference. And he wonderfully went, and I was surprised to go into his appreciation of summarizing the history of uh, Jacob Apollo, the initial concepts, and, and at some point, eventually, you know, I, I mean, repressors, the notion of accepting activators that was uh, not uh, 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 initially conceived. And then he mentioned that, uh, he said to me personally, well, when I read your paper, I said, who's, who's crazy enough to go and gather all that information then? And uh, uh, so, anyway, it's, uh, uh, you know, proud to share with you that, uh, he considered that that was somehow a, a what is it a change in the in the history of right of uh, of gene regulation and and we had this period of other people uh, Monica Raleigh with Peter Carp and others uh, gathering data and gathering knowledge and trying to to make sense of it. Um, um, uh, and and this sort of search, you know, the paper I, a friend of mine just uh, that I was enjoying in Mexico, told me that he went and sat and got into the reading the paper of, uh, of that PNAS or the grammatical model of gene regulation. And he said, Julio, I read it with a glass of wine, trying to enjoy it and follow you, but I just got no idea <laughs> <laughs> what you're doing. So that paper, I use it now as a clear, sharp example of my students of how science is communicated from experts to experts and, uh, and it's sort of a bad example in the sense of uh, I'm, I'm, uh, you know, in addition to doing research now, I'm also, because that's the situation in Mexico that's offering even more resources for you to get into innovative ideas and, uh, uh, and not only just uh, basic science. So my, what is called regular TV and continuous work since then of going and gathering inform uh, information and knowledge from, from X places into a database. It's been sort of transformed or reflected in, the, in something that I have, a, that I call universal knowledge of a, a way of, of sharing knowledge that could be of interest to the experts and nonetheless still understandable for the layman, right? Um, so that's a dream that I'm working on and that I have. Um, so, uh, so what is in co and that's what I want to do, to go into, and Bosby again is committed, he agreed, we'll be working on just explaining the notion of syntactic category at the molecular level. I mean, forget about the model and the complexities of rules and so on. I recognize and acknowledge that I've been very uh, uh, bad at uh, facilitating and putting into, into the adequate context of alternative classifications of promoters, class one, class two, class, class three, of class two, that, uh, don't get into the details, but uh, the challenge is to, is to make a classification that can helps to make predictions or at least make sense in a different way now with all these synthetic biology uh, ambitions. And, uh, so, so it's a, a project that continues on my, of what I would say my line of, uh, of uh, work of searching for integration, right? Integrative. Uh, so, uh, so I'm excited with the student working on what I call the, you know, I start with uh, uh, 
sort of a, a new concept of, I call it, sensor unit, for short for genetic sensory response unit. And many of you just as well you could say, well, what you are proposing is just obvious. I mean, getting a concept or an object that starts with the signal, goes into whatever is being transduced to knock the door to the genome, to get the genetic switch and then the final response. And this unit of collection of elements uh, to put them adequately into, into databases. I mean, you know very well that the, the complexity of interactions of cells and organs is far more uh, bigger and deeper than we've been managed to represent in databases. I mean, you know, you go to EcoCycle or Eoregulog and there's not even, and physiology is missing. And uh, so anyway, that's the, one of the science that I guess will not uh, focus much more, but uh, so let me share with you some few more uh, memories that I have with, uh, with bodies. Um, so uh, one that, that I just remember, like, uh, I mean, really wonderful, uh, in years later with a German colleague that uh, loved to organize conferences, uh, I organized with him a conference in a beautiful castle in the south of Germany, the Dutch school. Uh, castle for that uh, the German Society of, of, of Computer Science could have access to. So, of course, we invited bodies, and bodies came, and uh, people, you know, in the area of uh, theoretical and all this combination of, uh, of areas of research. And, um, and there was, among the, the people participants, was uh, the German uh, Michael that uh, some of you might remember goes. Uh, um, metabolic pathways from the Bering Company, uh, big posters that were hanging around the corridors of many uh, institutes. So he's the one that created those things, and I was, you know, at the cellar, at the uh, uh, underground. I mean, on the bottom of the castle, uh, bottles of wine after the one day of conference, and I had boys on my left and Michael on my right. We went for a glass of wine, and. Uh, and Boris said to me, you know, in between of a low voice, talking about all those uh, pathways, he said, well, you know, it's better to have all of that in your brain. <laughs> <laughs> um, I remember very well like that. He may that. be the only person. He may be the only person. <laughs> you know, he, was, he, he had such a, yeah, clarity. Well, in one of the discussions of the meeting, um, the, uh, uh, on all this, uh, uh, you know, uh, multi-stationarity and things of interest uh, now uh, on gene regulation, I just mentioned, well, Wiener did the first experiment in the 50s on the uh, bi-stability of the lac operon, and that was enough for Boris to stand up and, and, explain, and recall and explain to us what was the control, what was the experiment, what were the results. Um, uh, for me, it was, it had been, you know, wonderful, and we had uh, to, to interact with bodies to learn a lot of, uh, uh, about him, and uh, uh, and, uh, and not only on the you know sort of scientific, but also I mean we used to walking in Germany talking about uh, uh, the the, the, the uh, uh, churches and architecture and wondering uh, questions like why is it that if uh, that churches in Latin America. Are although it was conquered in the 1500, which was already the Gothic time in Europe, happened to be, there are not that many Gothic churches in our places, but more this thick, one, two meter thick of walls of uh, more Roman type of uh, churches and questions about uh, 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 this and other uh, things that we uh, love to talk about. So uh, um, I think I'll stop here.